Thank you very much. I'm honored to be here today presenting on our uh, program that we provide here within the city. My name is Jason Avery. Uh, I started with this program about 20 months ago. I've served a long career as a paramedic firefighter. Started my career in Coaldale in 1985. Uh, was uh, then moved down to Cardston County, was fire chief down there, worked on the blood reserve since 1998. During that time, I was also the uh, uh, assistant fire commissioner for the province of Alberta. I've uh, had the pleasure, displeasure of being part of the Slave Lake fires, the uh, Southern Alberta floods, the Fort McMurray fire, and that's what uh, kind of changed my direction in my thought process with where I was at in my career. And uh, in 2017, I uh, went full-time out on Blood Tribe because of the opioid crisis uh, that they've been experiencing since 2013. Seeing what we could do to try and uh, alleviate some of the deaths that was happening out on the First Nation communities. Uh, we started the Bring the Spirit Home Detox Center uh, I, I'm very proud to say that that was my thought. I developed the, the, uh, the program, the protocols, got the medical direction, and then when that project was done, uh, I moved on into the city and uh, was offered the position of running the Indigenous Recovery Coaching Program within the city. Uh, some of the things that I identified early was uh, uh, meeting the clients where they need to be. And meeting the clients doesn't mean going into the Civic Park and seeing them there. Even though we do that as a group, that's not what we mean by meeting them where it's at. It's where they at in their recovery. Are they active using? Are they in full recovery? Making sure that we can provide that full realm of service. So we started to develop partnerships, which my uh, co-workers will talk about during the presentation. Um, harm reduction. The city has a... a, a misconception of harm reduction. Harm reduction is saving lives. It's not providing a safe place for somebody to do drugs. It's providing a place where we can save their life. Giving them the tools to get into a detox, to get them into a recovery center, to provide some employment when they're done their treatment. It, it, it's not about providing a place for them to sit and use. So everybody thinks that that's what we are. We're not. Our, we don't hand out needles. Our only harm reduction that we do, our saving lives, is we hand out nasal Narcan. So if it gets left in a park, if there's no sharps left behind with it, it's just, uh, a, they put it up the nose, you give it a squeeze, and it's a piece of plastic that will be laying in the park. There's no sharp edges on it. If a child picks it up, easily disposable. Um, <clears throat> our uh, program is traditionally and culturally based around the Indigenous peoples. It's not around Blackfoot, it's not around Cree, it's around Indigenous peoples as a whole. In saying that, we still allow everybody and anyone to come through our doors. You don't have to be Indigenous. If you want to play a part in reconciliation, that's what we are. Reconciliation is every day. It's not September 30th. It's 365 days of the year where we can provide services, uh, have people come in that don't know Blackfoot and teach them some Blackfoot, uh, have people come in and teach them some beading, teach them some other craft, arts and crafts that we provide. It's about each and every day making sure the community understands that you don't have to be somebody that's in recovery we open our doors to everybody to come in and take part of our, our programming. And um, we want to help the clients find themselves. So in the culture of the Indigenous people, when you overdose or you're using drugs, your spirit leaves you. So um, hence why bringing the spirit home had the name in standoff. When we were developing that, we needed to bring the spirit home. That's bringing the spirit back into the body so you could fully holistically think mind, body, and spirit. You know, if you've got a mind and a body and your spirit is off wandering in the community someplace, you, we needed to bring that back. And we've got to center that, bring their spirit back with them, and then we can start on a re road to recovery. The journey can then begin. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to my 
colleagues. I've got Tennille Dizzard, who's going to come up and present, and Samantha Scout, who is going to come up and present. So I will turn it over to these ladies, and we will all be here for questions in the end. My name is actually Daniil Tizzers. <laughs> it's just a, a long standing joke in her office. <laughs> oh, you want me to go? Oh. Okay. Um, my name is Samantha Skelp, or my indigenous name is Ika Sawatsaki, Eagle Tail Feather Woman. Uh, and I am the program coordinator at the Indigenous Recovery Coaching Program. The Indigenous Recovery Coaching Program started in 2018, and since that time has seen, uh, overseen many changes throughout the years. Um, I recently started there about 18 months ago. I came from Regina. I was working in the different um, inner city programs in Regina, assisting with uh, homelessness uh, and addictions there. And so when I had come here, the program was already pre-established. Um, currently, we are a standalone organization. We're funded by the Federal Urban Programming for Indigenous People, UPIP. And currently the program that's running today is a lot, looks a lot different than what was previously established. Like so many changes had come into play uh, when Jason had started almost two years ago and then myself. We implemented a lot of um, community outreach that wasn't uh, pre-existing to when we arrived. We also implemented a lot of um, free fluid programming that was inclusive to all Indigenous people, not Blackfoot specific. Um, and that was due to us being in the community and realizing and noting that there is more Indigenous people here from all across Canada and the United States uh, that aren't being represented um, here. So we wanted to make sure that we're being inclusive to everybody and their needs. Okay. Okay. So our uh, vision and mission at the IRC is our vision is a restored connection to the old uh, life with new experiences from a shared spirits of Nitsitibi. which means the real people. So like Sam was talking about, it's all of our indigenous folks um, that are in our community. Our mission is to empower individuals in recovery with cultural guidance. So again, when we're doing all of our programming, we're bringing in that indigenous um, ways of life to the urban folks that maybe have lost touch a little bit with some of their culture. So what do we do? So as Jason um, very clearly explained it, but I'll just kind of lay it out a little bit more. The Indigenous Recovering Program is dedicated to proactively addressing the opioid crisis by implementing a comprehensive and collabor collaborative approach rooted in cultural sensitivity, compassion, and harm reduction. Our goal is to reduce opioid-related deaths, raise awareness about opioid misuse, enhance access to culturally relevant, compassionate, and non-judgmental services, and forge a holistic path for First Nations living in urban areas. So we foster open dialogue on opioid related issues to reduce stigma and encourage early intervention. Expand and enhance culturally sensitive treatment and support services for individuals struggling with opioid addictions. Educate healthcare professionals and service providers in culturally competent care to ensure a supportive and understanding environment. Facilitate collaborative efforts involving community leaders, elders, healthcare providers, uh, law enforcement, and other stakeholders to address the opioid crisis comprehensively. Develop a holistic framework that integrates traditional healing practices, mental health, and addiction treatment services. So kind of the reason why we're here too, right, is to really talk about the opioid crisis and talk about how it impacts individuals, specifically our First Nations individuals. So what can a participant expect when they become a part of our program? 
a participant can expect peer-to-peer -peer recovery support. A lot of our employees, volunteers, and students that come into the program to assist individuals have their own lived experience, whether it's they're in recovery themselves or they've supported family members um, and friends throughout their recovery journey. We also have a variety of culturally based programs that meet the needs of those looking to reconnect traditionally. A lot of the individuals that are in the urban setting and including younger Indigenous people are reconnecting individuals to their culture. So we're here to bridge that gap for them and to get their foot in the door to, to reunite them holistically. Uh, we also offer a direct connection to traditional Blackfoot elders and knowledge keepers. We're very, very fortunate at the IRC to have um, some very uh, well-respected and notable uh, Blackfoot elders that work alongside us in the programming. We have one of the traditional grandfathers from the Blackfoot, or, yeah, Blackfoot Horn Society, Roger Perry Chicken who offers a lot of our cultural teachings as well as um, a few other uh, Horns elders that come in and assist. We streamline services directly towards recovery. Each of our recovery coaches, um, alongside of being an Indigenous recovery coach, they have specialties that they specialize in and assist with. So um, I, we have Danielle who works not only as a recovery coach but also um, is kind of a specialist when it comes to income support and housing, finding those needs uh, for the participants. So once they're well established in their recovery journey, um, they will be referred to Danielle to assist with that. Um, we have uh, Daisy Plum. She is a recovery coach as well. And she is our detox treatment and medical transportation specialist. So all the treatment applications, she's She's the one that sends them out, completes them with the person, sends out the medical detoxes uh, forms to make sure that they're, we're not missing anything and that treatment centers and detoxes become familiar with her name, her face, and they know who they're contacting. We also have Rebecca Miller. She is our day treatment specialist. She designed our day treatment program that's currently running. Um, with the help of the recovery journals that Jason and I created for the program. Um, and she also does employment referrals. So any referrals for cover letters, resumes, they'll come through her. And she has a great partnership with SAMS and other organizations in the city. Um, we also <coughs> give them the opportunity to learn and create Indigenous art. What that looks like for an individual could vary. I mean, depending on how invested they are in the day, the day program for art therapy, they can make earrings, um, beaded lanyards, um, little teepees, uh, even art-like paintings and stuff. We offer the connection to traditional and holistic healing approaches, such as sweat lodges, pipe ceremonies, face painting, um, we often will take participants up to the Sundance when that's happening, um, and we'll be visiting historical sites in Alberta. Mm -hmm. The day program, as I previously mentioned, um, has really come into a lot of changes in the past 18 to 20 months. We implemented um, art therapy to be a consistent program that runs every Monday. That's all of our programming is open to the public. Um, you don't have to be in addictions to enjoy the programming. You don't have to be indigenous to enjoy the programming. We do um, welcome allies as well. We also have a peer support program where um, they talk about different things, more so of like a sharing circle, um, just to get an idea of where their thought process is, so that they can hear other stories in the group and see maybe they're being triggered today and didn't realize that their friend in the program was being triggered last week and they can utilize some of those coping tactics. We also have our eight week day treatment program, which is offered Tuesday and Wednesdays. And we have an elder session that's offered every week right now. It's the Blackfoot language beginner class that he's offering. Um, 
so that's every Thursday. And then the elder will also, elder and coaches will also do one-on-one -on -one counseling sessions with <coughs> individuals. Um, like I said, our elder is there for the public as well. If somebody wanted to meet with him and learn from him, that would be something we would welcome. And ever, every quarter we have a three-day culture camp that we offer in-house at IRC. We send out invitations to the public. We usually accept about 60 people. Um, and that could be, again, allies, support people, uh, those in recovery. It's open to everybody. So, so one of the key things with the culture camp is we bring in different elders. Like, with the culture camp, we bring in different elders that will provide uh, different aspects uh, as Samantha was saying there's societies out there within the indigenous people and the Horn Society is the highest uh, ranking um, society there is so us having Roger Prairie Chicken as our full-time elder is a huge honor for us as well as all of the people and with the culture camp he won't sweat females because that's part of the Blackfoot culture but our other elders that we bring in will run a sweat where everybody can come in and it's all inclusive. So we've really got to make sure that when we're doing these culture camps, and all of the cooking is done in-house by the staff and it's all um, traditional cooking. We're not going to order McDonald's. It's short ribs, it's fry bread, it's uh, taco. It's all traditionally cooked. So if in the next month there'll be an invitation going out and if anybody would like to attend and even just come for the meals because they are fantastic the meals that are provided so uh, a part of our facility is kind of the main room that we utilize it's kind of the heart of the home it's the Anuskam room that's the buffalo rock this is where we hold ceremonies, we hold programming. As you note, know, there are buffalo robes in there, our smudge boxes in there. So a part of what Roger does is keep the sage and the sweet grass burning throughout the day so that people can come in and if they're feeling disconnected, they're feeling down, they're feeling like they need a little extra support, then they can smudge uh, without having to ask. So again, I, <laughs> I will introduce our team. Um, as you're aware, we have our program director, it's Jason Avery. Um, I am the program coordinator, it's Samantha Scout, and we have right now five Indigenous recovery coaches. Um, that is Daisy Plum, Rebecca Miller, Danielle Tizer, Joseph Serna, and Lauren Digo. Our traditional elder in-house that is there every day is Roger Prairie Chicken. We also have elders that we consult with um, during our culture camps and we utilize them as well, Gilbert and Falma Eco Bear. We have um, a housekeeper, his name is Justin Greer. He's actually one of our program graduates. He's been in recovery for well over two years and doing very well. Um, so he was able to come and join the team um, after he successfully graduated from the program. Oh, oh, as well as Lauren Degout. He's also one of our graduates. And now he's a recovery coach. He went into Reeves College and completed the Addictions and Community Support Worker Program. So we're quite proud of them. We also have partnerships with <coughs> Dr. Tailfeathers. Dr. Uh, Dr. Tailfeathers comes in and assesses the needs of the participants. Um, maybe it's wound care, it might be blood work, it might be just general practicing. Dr. Webb is our OAT therapy. That's the opioid antagonist therapy, methadone, suboxone, or supplicate. Um, Dr. Luke Sanders is our psychologist, and he comes in to do assessments for age for our individuals. We also have a pharmacist that we work closely with. His name is Pashrat at the Care Carebridge Pharmacy. And oh, sorry. And we also have um, an on-site counselor that comes in every Wednesday uh, from the Alberta Counseling and Leadership Collective. Mandy the Checo Kalabawa. <laughs> okay. Okay. So what does our role look like in the community? So as mentioned, we do uh, community walks. So daily, um, 
my one or two staff will walk around the community. Now when we say walk around the community, we're typically trying to go to what we call hot spots, right? We want to go where we know people are kind of hanging out. So Civic is one of them, um, library, the gas stations, transit station, the mall, Streets Alive, Galt Gardens, uh, the shelter. And what we're doing is we're going out, um, number one, just to check on folks that are out in the community or a vulnerable population, indigenous or not. Um, we're also going out to check on maybe some of our participants that um, are involved with our organization that maybe we just haven't seen, they haven't popped by, we just kind of want to see where they're at, are things going okay, what do they need from us. We're handing out Narcan, nasal Narcan, like Jason said. Again, this is a very uh, harmless tool to overturn an overdose. Um, and is anyone here familiar with Narcan? A few people? Okay, so with Narcan, when Jason says that it's very harmless and the child can pick it up in the park, he's very right about that. So number one, it's not gonna poke anybody the nasal Narcan. And also with the Narcan, even if it had some form of Narcan left in it and it was sprayed, it would not hurt a child. I could right now shoot a Narcan up my nose and I would be okay. So there's no fear in that. So we're handing that out um, to people that are potentially using opioids, um, but also the people that aren't using opioids because if they're in the community, chances are they're around folks that are overdosing or they've been around overdoses. So our goal is to get the dark can out there. Um, we're also um, encouraging people to come and check us out at the ARC um, or any other service provider that we think could benefit them at that time. So if they're out there and it's this temperature and they need a coat, we don't provide coats, but we would send them to My City Care or we'd suggest they go to Streets Alive or we just suggest they go to the shelter, places where they can get their needs met. That's kind of why we're out there. Um, and then just also just to say hi, um, say hi to community members. This week on my walk, I stopped in at a few stores downtown just to say, hey, this is who we are, this is what we do, here's a card. If you have any questions, if you have any issues, call us. So like I said, we carry nasal narc or naloxone to hand out to the community. And we do a lot of partnering with other agencies and organizations to deliver services to the vulnerable population in recovery. So we work quite closely with um, with Streets Alive, we're working with First Steps, we work with the YWCA, uh, we work with The Watch, um, just a ton of agencies, SAMUS, Treaty 7, Aboriginal Housing, Lethbridge Housing, Alberta Works, AISH, um, the Treatment Centre, Fresh Start, the Detox at the Hospital, the Recovery Centre, Foothills Detox, you name it, we are working with them. Um, so we are really trying to branch out and kind of make sure that we're connecting with all the agencies possible to make sure that the people that we're serving um, have the best services available to them, but to also um, put that education out there to the community and to other service providers about what we do and also the issues that uh, are facing our vulnerable populations um, that come and see us. So like I said, we greet individuals, introduce them to our programming in the community, really encourage them to um, come by and chat with us. Okay, and so for donations, this always comes along. Um, a lot of times at Christmas time, we actually had some folks in here that stopped by, uh, either before Christmas, at Christmas, and uh, provided us with some donations, which were greatly appreciated. Um, so as a nonprofit organization, of course, we're always open to donations, right? Uh, we are entirely funded, um, like Sam and Jason were saying, by the federal government. Therefore, we do not receive financial assistance from the provincial government or the municipality. So we don't get those little small pockets that some organizations get. So we're always in need of the following donations that will assist the operation of our organization, our organization and meet the needs of participants that we serve. So financial donations, of course, we are always welcome to take. Um, so as, as though we do receive <coughs> monetary donations, it is very low compared to some of the other um, nonprofit organizations um, in the community. So, I mean, we're always looking for money that we could use for our feasts when we are doing cultural camps, uh, you know, to buy certain cultural items that maybe some of our uh, participants need. For example, when we have our cultural camps, um, women um, are required to wear like ribbon skirts or some type of skirt. So that would assist us to make sure everyone had the proper needs that they they need to participate in our programming. 
Uh, hygiene items is always something that we're looking for. We do have a shower that uh, individuals can use throughout the day. So we are always looking for shampoo, soap, conditioner, body wash, deodorants, lotions, combs, brushes, because um, we do go through it very, very, very quickly. Uh, towels is always a need for us. Um, again, some people take the towels with them or due to maybe wounds or something like that, we have to dispose of the towels afterwards just to make sure things are sanitary for the rest of our participants. So towels are always something we're looking for. Food donations, um, we're always looking for. So when we open up our doors at 8.30 in the morning, we always have bread out, peanut butter, jam, we have coffee, we have tea. <coughs> If we're lucky enough to have fruits or muffins and things like that, we have that out. So when folks are coming in, just either check in with their coaches, check to see what we're about, use the bathroom, use our day programming. We're encouraging them to get something in their belly because a lot of them probably haven't eaten for a day or two. Yes, we have the soup kitchen, but it's also the matter of getting there, right? And it's also a matter of who's there that maybe there's a conflict with and they don't want to go. So there's a lot of uh, barriers that a lot of people face where they won't access services that do feed them. So they do come into us because we like to keep our place very neutral. Um, we try to keep all issues on the streets outside. Uh, we provide a hot lunch every day. So after all of our groups, uh, we provide a hot lunch. Um, and we try to give the best meal that we can because we know that this is probably one of the only nutritious meals that that person will get that day. Um, so we tried to do that yesterday, we did Taco de Bay, the day before we had a, a massive pork loin in our freezer, so we did a wonderful uh, pork loin with rice and green beans. So we're also looking for things like that. Yes, we have a small pocket of money to buy foods and the Lethbridge Food uh, Bank has been tremendously generous to us, but we're always in need of snacks. So individuals, you know, uh, potato chips, puddings, um, <coughs> things like that, uh, bread, uh, we go through a lot of hamburger, things like that we're always looking for. And then bottles of water, um, we're always looking for for people that are leaving because we don't have takeout containers for them, especially when it's hot. So yes, the city provides water to a lot of nonprofit agencies uh, to hand out to participants when it's 30 plus. But when it's still 23, 24 plus out, it's still hot out there. So when we're out there giving the nasal Narcan and we're asking people how they're doing and they're like, well, do you have a water? I'm so hot, I haven't had a water in a few hours. We're like, ah, sorry, we don't, um, you know, unless the city has it or we have a pocket of money that we can buy it from. And then, uh, of course, hand and foot warmers, especially this time of year. So those things that you can shake, crack, put in gloves, put in boots, put in coats, so people can stay warm at nighttime because that's really important for our folks. We do get donations from the um, United Church, from the Blankets of Canada. They've been very, very generous to us. Um, and as Streets Alive also from time to time has donated us uh, winter clothing to give to some of our participants. But again, we're always in need, just like those agencies are always in need too. So just a little food for thought, uh, if anyone ever considers on donating or if you know anyone who is a donator or wants to get into the donating, uh, please think of us. Your talk was very compelling, but I failed to see on Can there, right? I'm almost eating it, <laughs> <laughs> but I've had my lunch. <laughs> Uh, I didn't see any contact information. Website, address, phone number, nothing I have, like that. We nothing got was up there. Yeah, yeah we, we brought, uh, we did bring cards and pamphlets, pamphlets but you're correct, we didn't. That was uh, my oversight on that. <laughs> but uh, we do have uh, pamphlets that have the information. Mm -hmm. uh, we've all brought cards that we're willing to hand out. Um, and just a second one. You yeah. You mentioned the various, you mentioned specifically the various organizations in the community that you interact with. Yes. You can't hear them, I, it's the mic, not me. You have to face this way. Face the mic. Face the mic. They have to hear me too. <laughs> and the questions to them. Better. Uh, <laughs> uh, the other question in relation to the organizations how do you work? with the city in relation to uh, the opioid crisis because we have so many two-edged swords everywhere. Mm -hmm. So, thank you for that question. 
So it's very unfortunate. We have been trying to work with the city. We've been trying to meet with the city um, to, to this, to, at this time to no avail. Uh, we, we've sent uh, numerous requests to meet even with some elected officials. It's unfortunate. Uh, they, uh, we rent our house from Arches. Everybody knows what Arches is. So everybody thinks that's what we are still doing there. They won't come in and actually come and hear what we are doing. How the services we're providing for the community. We're fortunate uh, MP uh, Rachel Thomas has come in to see us and she has taken a tour. She's uh, met with me before Christmas, kind of on a one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, she's very interested in what we're doing, but as far as provincial and municipal, it, the relationship is not there. And we are trying, uh, we try monthly to get in. Uh, we have met with a couple of city managers, but it's not, um, they, they still keep throwing out this Arches name at us. Uh, we, we're trying to, we're not Arches. We're the Indigenous Recovery Program. I'd just like to add that um, as a small organization um, and fairly new in regards to a lot of what we're doing, I mentioned before, uh, just came into play about 20 months ago. A lot of the outreach walks and stuff, a lot of people are just now hearing of us. We haven't ever had this much attention on the organization, I believe, prior to us joining the team. But I want to mention that we are doing our best in the community to support other organizations by providing naloxone kits. Um, we provide naloxone kits to the bus terminal as well as to Galt Park. Those are free at cost for them. They do um, cost something, but they don't have to pay for them. We also collaborate in the city with different things, different organizations. Maybe it's we're picking up needles. We meet with organizations to see how we can better serve their participants, how their participants can come to our program and utilize our services, and we can continue to partner with them to make sure that everybody is receiving that whole care and nobody is getting dropped within the systems. There's no um, no participants that are going on, how do I say it? Unsupported in the community. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, my question relates to uh, are you working in standoff? And I just noticed that uh, at uh, Brockett they have a state of emergency. Uh, are you uh, doing any work uh, in those communities as well? I, I noticed that you were working with Dr. Esther Tailfellas and uh, what kind of support does he uh, provide? Thank you for the question. Uh, yes, we do work with the uh, nations down here. Uh, on Tuesday, before uh, a state of emergency was declared out in Brockett, uh, I was out there at a meeting, meeting with uh, some of their elected officials and kind of giving them a little bit of my past and how we can move things forward. That was one of the recommendations that Dr. Tailfeathers and myself had put forward to their director of health was you needed to declare the state of emergency so you can start getting in front of it. Um, as far as the blood tribe, we work with them on a daily basis, whether it's um, through the shelter, bringing the spirit home, um, their wellness. Uh, once our clients move back to the reserve, uh, we can no longer serve them because we're urban funded. So we have to, our coaches have to connect them back with the services that the reserves uh, provide. Or Phillips, very interesting. Uh, I learned a lot. I was just wondering if you have some, uh, in 20 months, I believe you've been operating as IRC, uh, if you have stats as to how many people a clientele you have in the program and maybe your success rate. You say two are now employed and that's wonderful. So I like stats. <laughs> yeah. 
Again, another wonderful question. Um, we're very proud of, of, uh, of our stats. Uh, each one of our uh, coaches' caseloads are full. They've got at least 30 clients on their caseload. Um, so we've got two that are employed that we employ. We've also got several others that are employed within the community. It's the uh, OAT that Samantha mentioned is the new normal life for these individuals. They might be on methadone, they might be on suboxone. They can still work, they can still be employable. Just because they're on this medication, I'm not gonna ask a diabetic not to take their insulin. The same as I'm not gonna ask somebody that is going through a medical emergency. It's not an addiction anymore because we've gotten them past that. This is a medical emergency. So they are on these OATs to help them survive on a daily basis. And we gotta remove the stigma because I'm on Suboxone. I can't employ them. They are probably some of your best workers because they are so grateful to be able to come out and provide work. They're having a net worth. They feel good. Um, we teach our clients. It's a little accomplishment every day. Um, I was, I've been telling them lately, it's making your bed. So if you have the worst day in the world, you come home at night and your bed is made. You have a good night's sleep because that bed that you successfully made in the morning. So it's those little accomplishments that somebody who is struggling with this medical emergency is now getting a fulfillment and their next day starts out better because they climbed into that nice, warm, made bed and the next day they'll make it again. Uh, as far as stats, uh, we've got 300 on our waiting list. We've got our coaches are full. Uh, we are busy from the time we open up to the time we close. Uh, but uh, I'll turn it over to Samantha because she's got more of the numbers as the program coordinator. Thank you. Um, so just to give you kind of an overview of what we're looking at, and this is something I was reflecting on in the new year. So when I came in um, in May of 2022, um, we had a black filing cabinet, two, two drawer black filing cabinet about that wide. Just one of the top drawers was full, not all the way full, not packed, but full. And that was active participants, wait list, as well as the deceased files that we have to hold. Now, I have that black filing cabinet. I just recently got a new six drawer one, and then I have another two drawer, and we're full, full. I can't fit any more in there. So as we mentioned before, we do serve Indigenous populations and we keep statistics differently with those. Um, in order to maintain our funding, we have to have 75 active participants. And when I say active participants, I'm talking that they're actively working with the recovery coaches in phases two, which is preparation, phase three, action, phase four, maintenance phase five, independent. Independent is when they become a graduate. So currently right now on our graduate list that um, we keep them on for about a year, and nine, nine graduates. These ones, I'm not counting the ones from the previous year, but these ones are in the community going to school, they're working, they hold jobs, they have stable income, they have a home, uh, they're either graduated from their OAT therapy or they're consistent on their OAT, OAT therapy. We also have um, what we call our peer support caseload. These are participants that are in phase one, pre-contemplation. They're still thinking about it. It might come across their mind every now and then, or they might express that, hey, I need change, but they have numerous barriers that they have to overcome. So right now, our peer support caseload is at 118. 118 individuals in the community are thinking about going to treatment and detox. They're thinking they're ready. Now, what our day looks like or our month looks like is different every day, every month. But um, my most recent stats for December, we served over 415 individuals that month. Came in for a shower, came in to eat, came in for programming, came in to attend to the recovery goals. Um, and our wait list um, doesn't stay around as long anymore. We try, I try to have them filtered through every month at the beginning of the month. 
So our wait list right now, just from the new year, is sitting at six. And that is just a refresher. On the second, everybody from my wait list went to coaches. So we're pretty much at capacity. Um, mind you, Jason did mention like 30 right now. Our, we're co our coaches have pretty close to 45 participants on their case so phases one through four. And then the phase fives um, are the graduates that will stay with us for minimal things that might call and say, hey, I have an issue. I need some support going to the food bank. Can you help me? Then we'll send any coach to go and help them. Hey, I got a letter from income support or ish stating they need this. Can you assist me with that? So it's very minimal support. They're still being supported in the program, but not an everyday, a weekly thing. Hope that answers your question. That was very good information, thank you. Mary Shillington's by name. Uh, I've learned lots today, uh, and these, the, these stats are very helpful, uh, I find, too, for me, because I, I like to hear how well people are doing. And one of the things that you said was this being able to call back to you uh, with things, because that's often a problem with addiction, is that when you need somebody, you need them right now. And so if they can phone and connect with you, then that's, that's great. Um, uh, a couple of questions. Uh, one is, how are you involving doctors in, in your program? Uh, and what kind of support are they giving? And uh, uh, what kind of awareness are they uh, uh, presently have with the opioid uh, crisis? Uh, so that's one of the things I want to ask about. And the other thing is, what can we do to put a bomb under our, our well, maybe not a bomb, but maybe a fire, uh, <laughs> under our municipal uh, people to give support to this program and, and to work together with you? I'll answer the second question first. Um, I would encourage contacting your elected officials and telling them that you heard our presentation. Um, I too am an elected official for the town of Coaldale, so uh, you know I know I would appreciate, or I do appreciate when um, my bosses, which are the people that have elected me, phone and tell me when something good or something new is happening in, in our community. Um, this, the first question, uh, I, over my years of working in uh, fire and EMS, I was fortunate to build a lot of good relationships with a lot of good doctors. Dr. Tellfeathers is a, a godsend for the addictions and uh, mental health in Southern Alberta. Uh, it was a, a tragedy when she got removed from the Indigenous Health Authority Board. Uh, and uh, But the blessing was is it opened her up a few days a week to come and work with us and work with uh, the population in the city. Uh, Dr. Webb, he comes in uh, one day a week, but he is available to us five days a week or seven days a week if we want via Zoom to get them on the OAT therapy. Dr. Luke Sanders, he comes in whenever Samantha requests him. It's usually once a week, but that's so we can shorten that time down to get them on income support. So one of my friends um, who I worked with for years on ambulance uh, became a, an addict. He ended up on the streets in Lethbridge. Um, was on the streets for uh, just about 10 years. I kidnapped him five years ago and I put him into detox. This is when my mindset was changing. Um, so we put him into detox. We sent him to treatment. It took us over a year to get him any type of income. So us as friends and fellow co-workers, we paid for him to stay in a hotel in Lethbridge for over a year before we could get him any type of income support. We have now reduced that to five weeks with the physicians that are coming into our facility because they, they have to see Luke three times, two times, and then you have to have a medical done by uh, a doctor. So doc, they could come and see Luke one week, the next week they can see Dr. Tellfeathers, the next week they can see um, Luke again. We've done their three visits. We submit their paperwork, or Tennille submits their paperwork, and within a couple weeks, they're getting income support. So it's building those relationships and bringing those relationships into the city. Dr. Webb is from Calgary. Um, 
but it's the relationships built. You know, Esther's got to drive up from Cardston. Um, so, so it's, we built our model on relationships of the past. Uh, Bev Trainer, I just wanted to say that this is the one of the most encouraging uh, presentations that I have heard in a long time in regards to taking a collective approach uh, with the people that need it. Uh, and, and, and to me, it just makes, makes sense. I'm going to just reiterate what I think I heard from you people, and that is that it's a uh, federal funded program, and knowing just a little bit about politics, I'm very concerned that some of the, about some of the things I thought I heard that stand in the way. And I would like to think that the minds in politics are broad enough to make sure that they could all work collectively at a common problem but I'm not so sure that that's always the case. So I just don't want to see you people get discouraged. Question. My question is, what can you do to make sure that you do not let the different level of governments discourage you? Him. Okay. That guy, Perfect. this is why. So, I, I'm an, I, I've been a bureaucrat my whole career, so I know how to maneuver around government. Um, I, I was uh, instrumental in developing the Alberta Recovery Plan for the current government. Um, I was appointed by Minister Luan to go on to that uh, by Marshall Smith. Marshall Smith is now the uh, Chief of Staff for our Premier. Uh, I, I at one point would have called him a fairly good friend. Um, until I started working where I'm at today and he won't return a phone call or won't return an email uh, because uh, he's got this stigma that he can't release of uh, that this is arches. It's not arches. I've tried to explain it to him. I've tried to explain it to Eric England, the Chief of Staff for the Minister of Mental Health and Addiction. It's not. So we will continue working with the federal government I'm not worried about the provincial government. It's actually kind of nice not knowing that they don't have their thumb on us. We can work <laughs> as an organization and do what's right for the city and for the individuals that need our help. So, you know, internally we laugh and joke about it every day because we don't have the city's thumb on us. We don't have the provincial thumb on us. We can work as an organization developing and expanding our programming. Could I come to the microphone? I just want to note that um, when it comes to working in this type of field, it takes a certain person to be able to do it. Yeah. Not everybody can. And that's why we have allies in different areas to help us get to the goals that we want to reach with our people. Um, but also at the same time, I think enjoying what you do and who you work for is a big part of continuing the work on and making sure that we're meeting the needs of the people because it's not us that we're serving it's not um you know there are political leaders it's the people that need it you know the people that don't have anywhere to go that don't have anybody to speak for them don't have anybody to support them that's why we're here and their needs aren't going to go away. So I don't see the IRC going away anytime soon. Um, we really enjoy our jobs. Well, for a long time now, I have been looking for a place where I would like to volunteer because I do think I come with a few skill sets that might be of help along the way. So I will continue to be in touch. Absolutely, please. Uh, thanks for the presentation. You're in my neighborhood. I didn't know what was going on there, but now I know better. <laughs> um, I'm hearing about arches, 
And I didn't know that term in some sense even existed, but now I got the impression you're paying rent to Arches. So does, can anybody speak to what is Arches? And it sounds like the archaic minds and some of our city councillors need to be reversed by getting rid of a term. And why can't we get rid of that term? Yes, so Arches owns property within the city. Um, this uh, IRC was a program from within Arches um, when it first started in 2018. Um, Arches closed and their programming closed. The Indigenous Recovery Program was funded separately so the provincial government at that time could not touch them. Um, what I've been told is people from the provincial government phoned their counterparts in the federal government trying to get the funding pulled from the IRC at that time um, because they wanted everything that had to do with arches completely closed. They were not successful. Um, you know, the liberal government wasn't going to listen to a conservative government. So fortunate for me, I it brought an opportunity upon me to bring in the Alberta Recovery Plan, the, the Save Lives. It's, you know, I, I go back to harm reduction is saving lives. We, I, we, we won't use the word harm reduction. We're, we're saving lives by what we're doing. Um, harm reduction was what Arches was doing. It was providing a safe place for people to use. That's not what we do. If we see people using on our property, they are kicked off. We phone the police. Um, we do not allow the usage of drugs and or alcohol on our premises. It is a dry zone. So um, it's to remove that stigma because, you know, that's why I fly at the orange flag out front is so people know it's a different place than what it was. It's not, that's where Arches started as far as I'm told. It was started in that house. So they own real estate within the city. I don't know what other real estate they own. I just know that's, we pay rent to that organization. Thank you very much. That was a very compelling presentation. Lots of information. Um, my name is Bev Mundell-Atherstone, and uh, it's too bad that we don't have our high numbers that we usually have once the uh, once SACP has been in session for a while. Because, um, but this will go out on on our website and so on. Um, I'm just wondering, under what federal ministry you are funded and you said that you have to have at least 75 people that you're serving each month and you seem to be in excess of that so I'm wondering if there's any way to apply for increased funding um, so what ministry and increased funding and then um, Bev Trainer brought up a good point about volunteers so I wonder if you use the Lethbridge Volunteer Association to get volunteers, what, what possibilities are there. And then you were talking about need for food, and I wondered if you'd be in touch with any of the um, uh, corporate grocery stores or smaller grocery stores to see if on a rotational basis you could get some of the snacks that you're needing. Thank you. So um, we are funded by UPIC, that's the urban, sorry, <laughs> indigenous, the federal urban programming for indigenous people, that's UPIP, um, under the mental health, yeah, under mental health, that's who we're funded by. Um, unfortunately, we can't, without board approval, apply for funding outside of what we're already receiving. Um, so that's why we rely on community donations um, to come in and assist us. I have approached, when I started um, with the IRC, I had approached um, Save All Foods, what, um, Sobeys, and what's the other one? Safeway. We do receive a small portion of discontinued hygiene products from Savon Foods. However, we do not receive any food donations from any grocery stores or corporate stores. 
We were at one point um, fighting for bread donations at Cobb's Bread. Um, we don't no longer do that because it's after hours and none of us work after hours. So um, again, we rely on um, in, in community donations. Uh, yeah. Volunteers? Oh, volunteers are always welcome. We're not connected to any other volunteer bank or um, organizations. We have our own um, forms that we fill out and things like that. Like we. Not a lot of people have been interested in investing time into IRC. I want to be very blunt with that. We've set up um, at the college, at the university, at the library to draw people in. But because of our hours, we're Monday through Friday, 8.30 to 4.30. That interferes with a lot of people's work schedule, school schedule, parenting schedule, whatever it may be. So we haven't had a lot of volunteers. Uh, we do rely on our participants that are more in active recovery because they're the ones that will be like hey can I have a smoke if I shovel shovel your walkway and so then we use tobacco to um, gift them for doing a service for us um, but yeah that's pretty much how we run them Kiru Peterson again uh, just a quick observation on on social programs, and including what we we're talking about today. If uh, if governments would look at it as an investment rather than a cost, it would probably save us money in the long run. Uh, having that little, uh, I just wonder if you if you have worked with I know Alvin Alvin Mills. I believe has ran has been running a recovery program for the past two summers. I believe. Do you, have you worked with him on any level at all? Thank you for that question. Um, unfortunately, we do not have a working relationship with Alvin Mills. Um, when he established his recovery camp out by Thunder Chief Gas Station, there. Uh, last summer, I believe, or two previous summers in 2022, we did initially begin to send some of our participants that um, expressed interest in attending that uh, recovery camp. However, when our participants were denied medication that were useful in their OAT and in their recovery, or they were asked to leave the program by hitchhiking back into the city, we removed all affiliations with Alvin Mills's camp um, again, we're here to protect and be the voice for those vulnerable populations. And when we were having, seeing our participants in those states um, and you know, not being treated well, not being treated with dignity or respect, we did uh, sever our partnership with them. I'm gonna get the moderator's question. <laughs> I'm showing my age, but about 40 years ago, I was the first person in Southern Alberta to have a methadone license. And uh, didn't get a lot of use at that time, but the biggest use was the witness protection program where the police would put somebody in our community that needed drugs. So from my point of view, what's changed with naloxone as a nasal spray where you don't have to inject it. What's changed for you guys dealing with people on the street? So the, the biggest thing is it's quicker access, right? It's going up the nostril and you just push it. It's a four milligram dose. Uh, when you're giving IV, it's 0.4. So me as a licensed paramedic, uh, it's 0 0.4, 0 0.4, 0 0.4, 0 0.4, up to two milligrams. A nasal gives me four milligrams, one push. So I'm getting 10 times in one push. So I give two, it's done. Where I've, when I've got to draw it up, I've drawn it up, where's the needle going? I gotta draw it up, where's the needle going? So that's the biggest thing is time and waste. So we're not putting the debris in the community.
So uh, for the we got a trio here. What's your take home message for our group? And thank you for your presentation. I'll give one then you then you. Judge not for thou shalt be judged. Those on the street, recovery is important. Don't judge them. Relapse is part of recovery. And tell them that. All they're looking for is somebody to say hi. They ask you for money, say no. Buy them something to eat. Don't give them cash, because you know where the cash is gonna go. But judge not, and that's the philosophy of our organization. We will never judge anybody that comes through the door. If you were in recovery for a year and you relapsed over the Christmas break, that's all part of your recovery. The Creator has set that path forward for you, and we believe that uh, we're not a, a faith-based organization. We're an organization believing in faith in their recovery. I, I echo what Jason says. So prior to me joining the IRC this past August, um, I was in the domestic violence field for 17 years. Uh, one of the biggest things that I would always say to the staff that I worked with was you were only one, one, uh, one dismissal from your employment, one bad relationship, abusive relationship, you know, one bad party where you were introduced to a drug that you can't quit before you are in the feet of somebody else. We're only one step away from being in the feet of the vulnerable population that are on our street. I know that's hard to think of. A lot of us maybe have homes, pensions, houses, families that will take care of us, um, but not everyone is lucky enough to have that. And also a lot of our participants do have that big family support, did have really good jobs, did own houses, um, and unfortunately due to traumas, due to deaths, due to PTSD, due to a lot of reasons, um, have fallen into the addictions world, okay? And one thing that um, I like to stress, because I come from a family that is very conservative, very Catholic, uh, so we don't, we don't talk a lot about my work. <laughs> um, some of them are a little bit more open-minded, but that's what I ask people, be open-minded. If you don't know, ask, learn, phone us, phone other agencies. Um, because when we just listen to what our conservative governments or what our churches or other things preach about, we don't see the full picture of what people are like. Everybody out there is a human. When we get cut, we all bleed red, and so do the people that we serve. So just remember that at any point in time, anybody that you know, you yourself, a family member, could be in those shoes, and how would you like to feel? for them to be treated when they're going through the doors of an agency or they're walking down the street and they're meeting somebody. Wow. <laughs> um, I just want to say that it's always helpful to remember that that's someone's daughter, son, child, mother, father, grandchild out there that we don't know their story. We don't know their trauma. But we do know that they need somebody to love them and care for them. We don't know why they're displaced from their families. I've, um, my sister I lost to addictions, my only sister. She was the one that brought me on this path um, that I'm currently on. And I always think that I would rather be the person that my sister needed than this, the person my sister didn't need when she was in addictions. And she didn't get the help that these people are getting or the compassion that they're getting. Um, so just remember that that somebody's somebody and they are loved and they are missed. And if you could be a part of the recovery journey by even just listening to them, then do that. Don't forget, next week we have Belinda Crozum coming to tell us a little bit about Islamic. That bit and what's been going on lately compared to the old days.